almost don't want to say this, but when they, it's really not a big deal, but what is this person hiding? There are certain types of organizations, law enforcement, want very rigid type of work to understand that creative process can't be forced. And she started tearing up. And I started tearing up. And... Are you guys ever going to go back on cops again? Maybe one day. <laughs> All right, so today I'm sitting down here with Sergeant Darren Moss of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, and you are also a public information officer. Let's, let's get into a little bit of what that means, but um, thank you first off for taking the drive, making your way all the way out here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate to give, having the chance to sit down with you and have a longer conversation. <laughs> Most people see me for about 10 seconds on TV, so I really like this format, and again, I appreciate being able to speak with you in person. Thank you. So... Um, I wanted to understand uh, more about how public information officer works in Pierce County. You guys do it very differently. Uh, before we get into that, for those who maybe aren't from around here, tell me a little bit about the Pierce County Sheriff's Department and that area down there that you serve. Yeah, the biggest thing you know about Pierce County uh, is we have this mountain over here called Mount Rainier, or Mount Tahoma is what it used to be called. And for some reason, some guy came to America and changed the name. I like to always put that out there every once in a while. People don't <laughs> don't appreciate that, but... Let's call it what it was. <laughs> but Mount Tahoma or Mount Rainier is our huge landmark in Pierce County. Um, the main city is Tacoma. We're about an hour south of Seattle. Um, and what's interesting about our area is we have a lot, a lot of, you know, woods and forest areas. We've got tons of rivers and lakes. Um, but then we also have a suburban area and a downtown kind of city area or more urban area. You know, Tacoma kind of runs south into our jurisdiction and that, um, area where the city ends and the county begins is pretty much just a stretch of the uh, urban part of, of Tacoma. So we do have more city-like crime in those areas. We have a lot busier patrol districts out there. Uh, but then you can also work in areas like Bonnie Lake or Buckley where you don't have a lot of calls. You got more farmland and stuff like that. Um, and then down south in our mountain detachment, which goes all the way out to Mount Rainier, um, you've got, you know, lots and lots of fields. Everybody has 10, five, 10 acres or more. And we have a really small town at Eatonville who has their own police department, but we kind of assist them and we're surrounding, you know, that area with our, our patrol districts where you, know, you got two guys working and one guy could be on a priority call for an hour to get to his buddy who's on the other side of that division. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you work for the sheriff's department, um, you've got lots of opportunities to to figure out where you think you might want to work. We've also got two contract cities in University Place and Edgewood mm -hmm. where those cities um, have their own police force. But instead of building their own program, they just contract with the sheriff's department. We provide a chief and deputies to work that. And then they get all the extras like detective services, SWAT, uh, marine services or or search and rescue and things like that. So we've got uh, it's not a huge department. But when I tell you about these opportunities we have, it really compares to places like Seattle or I started out in San Diego Police Department. When I came here, I don't really feel like I'm missing out on opportunities. There's there's plenty, but we're a department that's the size of uh, you know 300 right now, but we're supposed to have 350. Hmm. Um, and then on top of that, we run our own jail and we have uh, 300 corrections deputies in the jail as well. And again, we you know provide jail services for. Uh, the rest of the county, so all the, the cities have to book in our jail for their felonies and um, lots of different areas to work in our jail from, you know, the booking area to the, the we actually have an in-house uh, medical facility. You can't do surgeries, but it really helps when a guy gets a boo-boo or has some sort of medication he has to take. We don't have to ship him out to the hospital. Mm -hmm. We have nurses and, and doctors in-house that can help provide some of that care. So um, lots of different opportunities in the sheriff's department, and that's what makes it you know, one of the premier places uh, uh, to work in the in the county and really in the state. I think we have, uh, you know, we're not so big where you get lost and no one knows who you are, but we're not so small that there's no opportunity or there's no promotional um, options for you in your career. What kind of calls do you guys usually get on, on an average week? Uh, in an average week, and you can expect we're going to have uh, probably three or four shootings or stabbings, major incidents. Um, they're not always resulting in homicides, but um, our, our districts stay pretty busy, and that's really in our our main central patrol area, which I said talks or uh, butts up to the city of Tacoma, and uh, that, that area is called Parkland, just south of there is Spanaway, and then as you go east, it turns into Puyallup and Graham. 
that's like where the majority of our calls are. But in those other cities and jurisdictions, we do get some shootings and, and stuff that happen out there, just not as often. Um, but right now in, in the whole state, you know, we get hundreds and hundreds of stolen vehicles yeah. every month. Um, we used to get about 300. Uh, there's been some changes in the law, which uh, does not allow uh, does not uh, allow us to pursue stolen vehicles anymore. And and one of the things I always tell people, it's not so much that we can't chase, is that they know they don't have to pull over anymore. So we went from having three to four hundred stolen cars a month to having nine hundred. Recently, we've dropped back down about seven twenty. And most agencies will tell you, oh, we've reduced crime. And I will tell you that's not true because we're still double what we used to be. So yeah. now we deal with stolen vehicles. We deal with a lot of um, fentanyl usage and people passed out in stolen cars high on fentanyl. And one of the challenges for us is waking that person up and getting them into custody without them hurting us, yeah. damaging the stolen vehicle or, you know, getting away. We don't want them to get away. But at the same time, we got to protect ourselves and not force a, a pursuit that's going to cause somebody else to get hurt. So we have a, a very wide array of calls that we have to go to. Um, you know, we have a, a full um, investigations unit with about 30 detectives. Uh, we have armed robberies that we have to cover. Homicides have increased in the past three years. So we have a homicide unit with two teams. Um, they stay pretty busy, but uh, thankfully... We've dropped our homicide numbers this year. I really couldn't tell you why because we still got a lot of people getting <laughs> shot. But I think um, one of the things we have, um, our deputies have a lot of first aid uh, gear that they carry with them that we didn't used to, like um, tourniquets and chest seals. And they're saving people's lives at some of these incidents where they probably shouldn't have made it. But, yeah, um, yeah it's uh, in the past they, they called Pierce County the Wild West yeah. um, because we had a lot of crime. We had a lot of meth labs back in the, the 90s. Um, those have kind of gone away now, but we've still got a lot of crime we got to deal with. But um, outside of that, it really is a great place to live. <laughs> we get into all the crime that we deal with. But, um, you know, the mountains, rivers, lakes, lots of outdoor activities, um, lots of different small towns and stuff to go visit. So. I've been here for my entire life. I did a three-year stint in San Diego, which I loved. It probably would have left if I didn't have a wife who wanted to come home. But, you know, we made this our home. We're raising a family here, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. We've had out here in King County now uh, for CPR calls, the deputies are actually usually beating my crews there because you can drive a lot faster than fire trucks can. Yeah. But <laughs> it's been a game changer being able to get deputies out there who have EMT certs, have gear on them, have AEDs in the car. Um, we should at some point try and do a story and try and figure out what those statistics are looking like now because i got to figure it's it's been a really positive move for the public and people experiencing that worst day of their life, having an officer be able to beat us there by minutes sometimes and get mm -hmm. on that. So with, with the staffing issues and the volume, are you able to do much proactive policing down there? Or is it pretty much you know priority ones in those peak times all the way through? Yeah, we we – so like you're saying with priority one, two, three, and four – um, a priority four call might be a vandalism. Somebody spray painted your house overnight. No one's in danger. Priority three could be similar kind of report call, a burglary, but no one's in danger. You came home from vacation. We got to take a report. And then a two would be an active domestic violence call. And a one would be a shooting or a stabbing. We are, we are going to all of those calls. Mm -hmm. The issue is our, our, we've got way too many one and twos now mm -hmm. and those three and fours have to wait longer for us to get to those reports. And the thing that really stinks is, you know, with this push to not, um, um, pursue vehicles anymore. And it's really driven up our auto theft numbers and our burglary numbers because they're using stolen cars to commit burglaries, knowing we can't chase for burglary or auto theft. Um, we have exponentially more reports to write on those cases, but you just have to wait for us to get there and it really drives our proactivity down when we have these high call volumes of hey we've got if you're a deputy you have a district assigned to you and you come in you might have one call to go to you go handle it and then all of a sudden you've got three more reports to take for stolen vehicles in your district and a shooting comes out so you're rushing to the shooting those other three calls have to wait and you might be on that shooting for two to three hours um, when I got to write a report on that but you got to go to three other report calls. And while you were on the shooting, you had four more report calls come in. So that day shift guy, as he's winding down, the swing shift guy comes on and he's got 
eight reports on the board he has to go to at some point in the shift. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that really hampers on the deputies that are working the street, how much extra stuff they can do. Traffic stops, um, suspicious vehicles that they happen to see, not that they're going uh, to calls for. Mm -hmm. It really limits the amount of time we can do those things. We did have some other proactive units, and we've had to cut those down to basically just one unit, a group of seven that does like all those jobs at the same time. Mm -hmm. So community liaison, uh, special investigations, which is narcotics, the prostitution stings, and everything else. And then our code enforcement deputy, um, who would work with code enforcement to evict people or to you know get houses board up and, and be that security officer for them. That's also included in that one proactive team we have right now. Um, as we build staffing back up, we can open those units up. We have opened our community liaison unit back up because uh, they were the ones that were dealing with a lot of the homeless issues mm -hmm. that we had. They provide resources. They go out when there's problems. Uh, you know, they try their best to get people to move on on their own. And if they can't, then they have to trespass them. And majority of the time, people have warrants. And right. that's when we start arresting people because they're not abiding by the rules. But, sure. um, yeah, proactive activity, I definitely would say, has gone down, which in a lot of areas is going to be the case when you're losing uh, your staffing. For sure. So how many years have you been with Pierce County Sheriff's Department? I've been with Pierce County Sheriff for 12 years as of July. How has that, how has policing changed within that organization over those 12 years? Yes, <laughs> it has changed a lot. And I go back even further, um, three years before I got back home here, I worked for the city of San Diego as a police officer for three years. And the rules were different in California than in Washington state. And we had um, even more uh, things that we could do. People had what's called a fourth amendment waiver. So when you're on probation or parole, we have the same thing here, but it's just only department of corrections can go to your house and do a random search mm -hmm. because you're on parole. Well, in California, any law enforcement officer could basically act as your uh, mm -hmm. parole officer. So I pull you over, you have a fourth amendment waiver Hey, step on out, sir. I'm just going to make sure abiding by your conditions that you don't have any drugs or guns or knives or stuff you're not supposed to have. And we could search his entire vehicle and his person for any illegal stuff. And it's actually a really useful tool um, to keep people uh, minding their P's and Q's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and the ones that weren't, it was really easy to hook them up when, hey, he was over at this house where there was a shooting. He's two blocks away. He matches his description. We don't even, you don't need the, the probable cause all the time because he has a fourth amendment way of your search and find the gun that was used in the shooting. So um, that's where I was coming from. You used to be able to search vehicles off of probable cause. You pull someone over for a DUI or you arrest them for a warrant they had, you could search the inside of the vehicle. That was still true when I got to Washington and then um, the law changed and you can't do that anymore. Not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent. That's just the way the law used to work. And so now we can't do that anymore. Um, you know, when I first started in Pierce County as a deputy, um, we had a lot of freedoms to do all sorts of stuff. We were the agency where if a pursuit came into the county, it did not leave the county. That was the rule. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's kind of people say you chase it till the wheels fall <coughs> off. Me, I love doing the exciting stuff, but I'm not one that likes to get in car chases. I've only been in one pursuit where I was a lead car and the person ended up just pulling over. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it was like, oh, well, that's great. I don't get to chase anybody. But a lot of vehicle pursuits uh, in our department's history, um, but our guys are really good at them mm -hmm. and they're really good at ending them, um, you know, pitting the vehicle, getting sticks out so we can flatten the tires and getting that person in custody. So it's not just that we're taking extreme risk, but the more often you are involved in pursuits, kind of have a better feel for it. And everybody in the department, especially our graveyard guys, um, there's no one on the road. You can drive a little bit faster. Um, you got you got more time and space and distance when you're when you're pursuing someone at night. Um, they get really good being professional drivers mm -hmm. um, and professional pursuit drivers. So moving forward to today, those uh, pursuits kind of go away. You used to get a car just for a infraction for speeding or something, and it would take off. And the thought process behind chasing a vehicle in the middle of the night for an infraction would be, it's really not a big deal, 
but what is this person hiding? Mm. Because the majority of times a person has a warrant, mm -hmm. their DUI, or there's something else going on. They have drugs in the car, they've got a gun in the car. Um, and I understand the, the push to say, hey, you know what? If he's just speeding and he crashes and hurts himself or he crashes into a house and causes all this damage and we're just chasing for speeding, that's definitely not worth it. So we've had law changes that has basically taken those um, decision-making away from the deputies and the sergeants mm -hmm. and made it a black and white outline of you will chase or you will not chase for any crimes other than these specific ones. And um, it has lowered uh, pursuits. Pursuits have gone way, way down in the state. Unfortunately, we've seen traffic fatalities have gone way, way up. In 2022, they were the highest they've been since 1990. And that's put out by the Washington um, State Traffic Committee, Traffic Safety Committee, I believe. And, you know, so there are good and bad consequences to the changes in the laws. It seems like um, the perception around policing in the country got really sour in 2020 and 2021. And, and now in 2023 especially in our area or our region on the western side of Washington State, we're seeing an influx of violent crime and an influx of um, just kind of recklessness. And it's even getting to younger people now. We have a lot of teenagers are getting involved in stealing these cars. They use a stolen car to ram into a business, and then they're stealing $400 worth of product. Um, but they cost $70,000 worth of yeah. damage to the business, and they totaled a a stolen car that was maybe a brand new or 2021 uh, Kia Sorento or something. Um, it is really interesting to see how not just the law changes, but when I was a brand new baby cop in Pierce County, um, I was going to a lot of fraud calls and we still have fraud occurring, but there's so much more um, like I call them action calls where it's like, Oh, somebody got shot here. Somebody got stabbed here. Hey, we've got a stolen vehicle. We're behind. Hey, there's a guy slumped over behind a wheel in a stolen vehicle. Um, we see that stuff a lot more than we used to. We've always been pretty busy in our busy district, but it seems like it's getting even more uh, hectic, I guess. And it's, uh, for me, I used to live in Parkland and Spanaway. That's where I grew up. Yeah. So that's my home. Um, I've lived throughout most of the county, except for the cities. It's funny because I've always lived in the county, mm -hmm. um, even though I've moved from you know, Spanaway and Parkland to Puyallup to Bonnie Lake and uh, never made it into any of the city jurisdictions. <laughs> but um, so I really take it personal when people talk about our area and say, oh, well, it's just bad or there's just bad people out there. And I'm like, no, the people that are out there are still those really good, hardworking people, but they have a lot of challenges with the people that are choosing to commit these crimes. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, it's kind of a revolving door right now. We're seeing the same people over and over again. We don't have a bigger number of criminals in the county. It's just those same criminals are doing a lot more crimes. Yeah. Something that's come up recently, and, and I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on it. So uh, departments, I believe Redmond's one of them, are now attempting to put tracker devices on fleeing vehicles. And I haven't seen their numbers yet, so I don't know if it's been successful or not, but I've found it interesting, the idea of placing a tracker on a vehicle. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something you guys have looked at down there? Or if that's a, a, a realistic option to look at? Yeah, we've looked at it. And um, the, the thing that would be helpful with these trackers is that you, you know, we would be able to abide by these pursuit laws, terminate a pursuit, but still have a way to try to apprehend our suspects. Yeah. Um, there has been challenges in the past with, you know, if I'm doing a, a full investigation, I have to get a warrant to put a tracker right. on your vehicle. Yeah. So we don't know necessarily how that will play out in the long run. But one of the things that seems to be allowing this to occur is that if I'm behind a stolen vehicle or an armed robbery suspect or something that just occurred and I don't want that person to get away and I have this tracker that I could use to, like, just follow it and find him, I don't have time to go write a warrant. Right. And i got to pull over, write a warrant. It's going to take me an hour send it to a judge in an email, wait for him to answer it and email it back to me, even if it only takes 10 minutes for him to respond. You know, the, the, the bad guy is not waiting, and right. I can't keep pursuing for that hour while I'm waiting for this warrant to get approved. So um, the technology sounds great. Um, people think that we always have an airplane or a helicopter <laughs> and a canine ready to go, and they're right there in the pursuit. And 
even the agencies that have helicopters, they're not always in the air. Yeah. They're not always right there. When I was in San Diego, I worked at the border region in San Ysidro, and um, the helicopters were based downtown. And so even when they were up in the air, it was a minimum of like 10 minutes for them to get to the yeah. border. So think about a 10 minute pursuit at 80 miles per hour, how much distance you're covering, yeah. waiting for a helicopter to get there. We don't have time for that. I got to end yeah. the pursuit. Um, so having those trackers would be really useful. Um, but yeah, we'll see. There's always a cost that's yeah. involved and it's not cheap technology. Um, hopefully it'll, it'll be helpful because again, we've had a huge increase in our stolen vehicles throughout the region going from, I said, just Pierce County went from, 300 up to 900 or back down to seven i'd like to see it back down to 300 mm -hmm. and for me to get on tv and say we've decreased uh auto theft numbers would be back in the 200s mm -hmm. which we've never had so i would love to to have those numbers go way way down and have crooks go you know what we just can't get away with this anymore we better right. stop right right yeah it's interesting on the trackers i thought the same thing it seems like the technology is advancing faster than the law but there's such a desire to find alternatives that they seem to be throwing caution in the wind. I'm really curious to see out of Redmond what comes out of some of these cases go along because the concept sounds good, but a lot of a lot of good intentions don't always make it all the way through the finish line. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit about how you became a cop. What what was your background before this? Before this, I was going to be um, the Rock Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> I. Uh, you know, I loved movies. I loved wrestling when I was a kid, and I loved playing sports. Uh, I thought I was going to play in the NFL, and if I wasn't going to the NFL, I was going to be a movie star. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, none of that stuff happened <laughs> for me. <laughs> but um, uh, I went to school at uh, Washington State University, go Cougs. Yeah. Um, I was a broadcast news major, which might surprise some people, but maybe now it makes sense that that's why <laughs> I do the PIO stuff for our department. Um I loved being able to do um, get on TV, and like I said, I wanted to I wanted to be the the guy who was on TV, but I wanted to do silly stuff. Um, mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I did video productions and I did the news at lunchtime, and I was I wanted to be the man on the street reporter. I wanted to be the guy who made funny, silly videos and stuff like that, and I try to bring that into what I do now. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's kind of like where I started. Um, I did play sports. Um, I was a walk on for the football team, but I didn't play one second in a game. But, <laughs> you know, it was a blast just being able to be in the locker room, seeing your name on a jersey and being able to interact with these guys who some of them went to the league and played. And it was just a really cool experience for me. Um, when I graduated, my wife now, she had an internship in San Diego mm. and I did my internship credits as a T.A. for the broadcast class. And I really didn't have a plan for a job outside of that and i was like huh well if you're going to san diego i guess i'll go too with no plan in mind and my father is a uh, detective and he's still a detective on our department right now um and he had put the idea in my head hey you should apply um, i applied for a couple agencies up here before i left and one of them red marked my paperwork really bad and it was like i had finals on friday and my interview was on monday and I need all these records and phone numbers from people I haven't talked to in 20 years. And I was like, oh, uh, I'm not going to be able to finish this. But I showed up to my interview. They're like, yeah, you sound like you'd be a good candidate, but you didn't finish the packet. So I can't recommend you. And I said, that's fine. I'm moving to San Diego on Friday. So <laughs> <laughs> see you later. <laughs> and uh, when I got to San Diego, it was kind of the same thing. Um, it was in 2008. And the media industry changed very wildly and newspapers were firing people and they were, you know, everything's going to blogs and online stuff. So it was hard for us to get uh, news jobs. And I was like, you know, I might try this law enforcement thing. And I ended up getting hired with San Diego police department. And I remember being in Academy and we were at the range shooting all these different guns. Um, and I was like, I'm getting paid to do this right now. Yeah. And two times a week we'd go run, and in the summer we went and ran on the beach, did our three-mile run there, and I was like, people were complaining. I like to run, <laughs> and running on the beach and getting paid to do it, I was like, my guys, do you understand how cool this is right now? I was like, this is, this is a dream. And I think that's when I kind of first knew I was headed in the right direction. And then, um, yeah, just those three years in San Diego were a blast for me, but yeah. started a family wanted a little bit more 
uh, security on being able to afford a place to live. And mm -hmm. me and my wife knew that uh, coming back home was the right option. And so I applied with none other than the sheriff's department where my dad was working. He had told me to put in some other agencies that made more money. And I was like, I don't care about the money. I was like, when I applied in San Diego, it was hard going in an interview, not hard, but going in there and saying, you know, I really want to serve my community because I just moved here. Right. <laughs> coming home and being on that board and telling them the reasons why I picked Pierce County. And I'm like, look, I've lived nowhere else in my life other than the county. Why would I want to work for this city or that city or picking a different county or even state patrol? It's like, they're going to put me on the east side of the state. I didn't grow up there. I want to be home and I want to serve the people and give back to the community that raised me. Yeah, makes sense. When uh, throughout it's your career you come in, New, new new deputy. At what point did you start eyeing the job of PIO? Um, you know, it's funny. I didn't. I did not want to do it at all. Um, when I got here, I was thinking I was going to do uh, be a boat operator for our Marine Services Unit because they made a lot of overtime in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know, SWAT sounds kind of cool too. I think, I think SWAT would be what I want to do. So I did. After a year on a department, I got on the SWAT team. But uh, really early on, the sheriff now, uh, Ed Troyer was our PIO for 20 years. He reached out to me and said, or actually reached out to my dad and said, hey, is your son interested in doing the PIO stuff? He should come in and do some camera work with us. And uh, I was, at first I kind of shrugged it off. I was like, no, I want to go do high-speed stuff and mm -hmm. kick indoors and do all the fun fun things. Mm -hmm. And um, But then I think it was my third or fourth year on the SWAT team, I was looking at promoting to detective, and uh, Troy reached out to me again and said, hey, would you be – willing to do some videos with us and, and maybe do some backup PIO stuff. And at that point, having missed out on doing broadcasting uh, for a career, I was like, you know what, that would that would be fun. I think that would be cool. I was like, do I have to leave SWAT? He's like, nope. And I'm like, yep, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's where I kind of got started when I was a detective. I applied and was uh, a backup PIO uh, for about four years before uh, the, the sheriff got elected and then chose me to be his PIO. At that point in time, what do you believe the job of the PIO was you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? What was their role in the department? That was one of the biggest questions I had yeah. <laughs> when I got the job. And I was like, you know, I know he goes on TV. Uh, the sheriff did a lot of radio interviews. Um, but I wasn't quite sure how his days looked. I was like, are you really getting calls all day long for media requests? Or do you kind of go out and make stuff happen and try to figure out what's going on? So... Uh, the the best thing that I think that the sheriff did for me and what has helped me to better our department and our, our reach outwards is he handed me the keys. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, people hand you the keys with no instructions. Mm -hmm. His instructions were, hey, have fun and make it your thing. I want you to do what you want to do with this. Don't try to be me. He's like, you've got skills. Go do what you need to do make us look good. And it's been really helpful that I have a lot more say in what occurs for our social media, for our outreach, um, for the news interviews that I do. For me, showing up here and talking to you today, I don't ask anybody for approval to be here. Um, he trusts me. He, he thinks that I am going to do what's right for the department. It really helps to be able to skip a lot of approval steps and make things happen. I'm I'm mixed race. I'm black and white. Yeah. Uh, my dad is is black, and he's our detective on our department. Um, people think that you got to fit in a box, yeah. and people think that you know a, a black or a brown person or a woman could never be X, Y, or Z. And I I never will ever get on camera and tell you, well, because I'm doing it, you can do it. But I you know that message is in there, and I think one of the ways that I'm able to relate to people in communities that don't normally view police as good people is they just see somebody that kind of looks similar to yeah. their nephew or their kid or themselves. And I would hope that uh, by me just being here and being who I am, that people can see like, okay, there is no color code to this thing. It's just, we got a guy up here who likes being on TV and he's mm -hmm. compassionate about what he does. And he really actually truly mm -hmm. wants to help people. There's a place for everybody to be in this profession and police in the way that you want to do it. 
because you think you come in and they're going to teach you, well, you got to beat people over the head at least 16 times before you take them to jail. And it's like, <laughs> that is not the FTO process that I yeah. went through. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when I go to a community um, and the people look like me or, you know, they're it's black communities or even the Hispanic communities or whatever the culture or race is, you know, I give them the same service I give everybody else. Mm -hmm. I'm personable. I'm approachable. As you can tell from this interview, I yell at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but being able to police in your own style, again, I don't want to write traffic tickets. I am good at giving warnings and making sure people understand the weight of their decisions. Um, when I arrest people, I make sure they understand everything that we're going through, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm sorry that we're going through this, but, hey, we've got stuff to work on, right? And mm -hmm. you're going to go to jail. doesn't mean you're guilty, but, you know, you got to deal with this, and here's the reasons why. And a lot of times people would be so surprised to see that we get a lot of thank yous. And I'm so sorry that you guys had to come out here for this when we take people to jail. Um, and you, when you come into this profession, you get to decide how you police. Mm -hmm. You don't have a sergeant saying, oh, no, you're going to beat that guy up today. Or, oh, you better arrest that old lady for not paying her parking tickets. Like, the choice is yours. There's things where we have mandatory arrests. Yeah, I got to arrest this guy for domestic violence, but I don't have to yell and scream at him if I don't need to. Right. So I really like that I get to police the way that I want to, just like I get to be the, the spokesperson the way I want to be. So anybody who considers it, just remember, nobody's going to hold a gun to your head and say, if you don't act like a stone cold cop, you're not going to make it here. You got to be able to do the job. You got to be able to use force. And that's not easy for some people. You got to be able to turn it up when you need to. But at the end of the day, you still get to be yourself and you get to be goofy or you get to be serious. I wouldn't recommend crying at every call you go to because it's a, <laughs> there's a lot of calls. You can have a lot of tears. But, um, but yeah, you can be uh, – one of our deputies was a social worker before she came here. And she has six kids. Yeah. She has six kids. And she does this job very, very well. And it doesn't matter where you come from. It just matters about what you're here for. And, and making sure you can keep yourself and other people safe, but doing the right thing is the is the most important thing. You got to have you got to have the desire to do that. Makes sense. So I'll give kind of what my perspective has been with a lot of departments, and then let's lead into really why I wanted to sit down and talk with you today because I think what you're doing down there is really unique compared to a lot of other organizations. So um, generally, the PIO is going to have also some special training, understanding from disclosure laws, other layers, and that's why they really get tasked with talking to the media so you don't have somebody on scene giving too much or, or, or whatnot. But a lot of departments that we work with out there when we're trying to get statements or info, it's, it's very limited. And their communication directly to the public is very limited. It's usually going to be a Facebook post. It's very bullet point. And what I noticed as you've settled into your position more is you've really gotten uh, an unusual skill in this field to do the storytelling, do it quickly, and really become the authority ahead of the news, where a lot of times the news wants to come out and tell the story. The department then discloses whatever they want to to them. And then they don't have control anymore. And control matters sometimes, you know, and I think having media keep people in power is in check. That's great. I'm all for it. But yeah. um, they also have other things. It's not just keeping power in check. It's they have limited amount of time to tell a story. They have limited time slots that, you know, and, and depending on what else is happening, not just locally, but around the world, you may even be less time to tell that story that probably really matters that the public should know about. And so what I've found is so much different that what you do is, is you actually, maybe from your background, it, you're able to do the camera work, put together the narrative, shoot it, cut it, put it out. And it's usually about the time that the rest of us even found out that the incident even happened. Yeah. We want to run down there and you've already posted it and posted it well. And it's, it's, um, it's relatable. It's done with personality and also understanding the gravity of the, the incident that you're on. How did you get to that from coming in to just making sure that the media gets the facts so that they can hopefully go report it accurately to really being the tip of the spear on that and making it to where the public's usually turning directly to you to understand what's happening instead of going to TV? Well, I want to thank you for saying being the tip of the spear because <laughs> I think my SWAT guys would appreciate that, <laughs> that reference. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things, like I said, I didn't really have a, a set guideline of what I have to do when I go to a homicide scene. And 
Um, when I got there, the biggest thing for me was, okay, I don't want to screw this up. I don't want to say stuff I'm not supposed to say. But um, it only been two years removed from being a detective. So I understood what we're doing at the scene, how long it's going to take to secure a warrant. You know, we have initial details, but what are the other details that we kind of think know has happened, but we haven't been able to verify mm -hmm. yet. Um, so getting to the scene first off, I'm, I'm waiting for that information. And while I was sitting there waiting, I would say, oh, that looks kind of cool. And I would take a picture and I'm like, Ugh, iPhones don't really look great in the dark. So mm -hmm. I switch it to a video and I start taking video and have a little bit of light in there. And, and then I wanted to share this video of this scene, but I also wanted to be able to tell you what was going on. And I felt like, you know, just writing words was not my thing. I'm not, I, I do know how to write. <laughs> I went to broadcast school and I had to do print journalism and broadcast journalism stuff. But uh, being on camera was where I really felt more comfortable than making sure I'm getting the information written down correctly. And I don't want to sound like a robot. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to speak the way I would speak. The way I'd speak to somebody if they asked me what happened at the grocery store or somebody pulls up to the scene and say, man, what's going on here? You know, without getting into the, oh, this dude got shot, you know, really relaxing on it, you know, make it professional. But um, my first couple, unfortunately, homicide scenes I went to is where I'm doing a lot of these videos is it was just me memorizing what the details were and talking directly in the camera. And then I figured out that I had a app I could edit on my phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now all those cool videos and shots I was taking, I was just taking those for B-roll mm -hmm. for other videos we we're going to make in the future. And I said, well, if I can cut these in, I can just read the script of what I want to say. And now I can really show you what the scene looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so people, I hope, are getting the understanding, like, my role as a PIO, I want to give you as much as I possibly can, but you have to understand I can't interfere with that investigation. Right. Having the relationships with the detectives and the lieutenant for investigations and stuff has really made it easy for me to get them to be on board with what I want to do because at the end of the day, the detective says, don't you dare, then I'm going to back off. But I remember there was a homicide that was very, very hard um, with family members being involved in, in being the victims and the suspects. And um, I told the detective, I was like, I want to tell a little bit more about what happened. And I know that you really don't, but we don't have any work here. We have our suspect. We have witnesses. It occurred in the house. Like, it's wrapped up. If we don't tell the news what's going on, they're going to show up. Mm -hmm. They're going to make it a bigger thing, and they're going to make this might be really embarrassing for this family to have to deal with. If we just do just a little bit more, they'll get the information. They know they don't need to come out. I'll have a photo or a video for them. They can use that. We're going to save face for that family that's dealing mm -hmm. with the one of the most terrible things they ever had to deal with, and I'm still doing my job getting that information out there plus a little bit more to protect the investigation because now I don't have reporters showing up on scene trying to figure out because most of the time you're going to see an agency might just go police activity, stay out of the area. Mm -hmm. And what do the news do? They call the PO, what's going on yeah. there? So that was kind of where I knew, okay, I think we really need to make sure we're telling as much as we can because we take away that... Um, that worry that the media is going to do something else with it. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that the media is bad. The media's not bad at all. It's like, but their, their job is to be curious and to inform people of what's going on in their region. And if you're not telling them something, they got to go find the answer somewhere else. So I want to be that source. I want to be a reliable source, not just for the media folks, but for the people that watch me on TV, they go, you know what? I've seen him before. I trust what he's going to say when he comes on TV. Um, when I go on social media and I post more information than you're seeing from other places, I would hope that that just adds to that trust. And in all reality, it's kind of like one of these, it's not a Jedi mind trick, but at the same time, it's like, you don't just trust me, you trust my department because right. I am a representation of my department. And ultimately I want you to trust the Pierce County Sheriff's department and I want you to trust all your law enforcement departments, but 
I work for us, so trust us the most. <laughs> I've noticed in some years too, I think personality matters a lot. And so sometimes, especially in that type of profession, people can be very rigid. There's a lot of responsibility to a lot of different people, including the victims, as you were talking about. And you end up with people who are very well trained, good at their job, and just rigid and, it, and it not not relatable. And you've your unique personality and that people really enjoy hearing your storytelling as well. You've had some one recently where a deputy, they couldn't get the dog. So he pretended to be the dog. Yeah. <laughs> it was a successful uh, attempt. It worked out well, but the, being able to tell those stories in a way that, that, that got a lot of traction and just the, it, the story itself was good. The way you told it, I think made it better and helped get that spread out to where then the media was also trying to cover it too, but it did really well online. And, and so I think for departments out there, finding the right person, not just checking the boxes, but actually understand, will this be an engaging personality? Because that matters a lot, especially today. That matters a lot. People are so quick to just keep swiping, get to the next thing. You got to get that right person that can actually grab their attention and get them to stay and listen. Yeah. And I think that um, that's some of the advice that I would have for other agencies is Sometimes you'll see that an agency just assigns that role to a person in a specific, specific position. So the lieutenant over operations has to do PIO stuff. And, and I get it because some of the agencies are really small. If you have 30 people, you don't have the budget or the manpower to give one of those guys just to doing media interviews. Um, and you might not need it because you have a really low call volume and you don't have a lot of bad stuff going where you need to get stuff out to the media. But... If you do have the options to pick who you're going to have on TV, I think the the number one trait they have to have is that they want to do the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're a, if it's an assigned thing, if you assign me to, to write 100 traffic tickets a week, I'm going to stink at that job because that's not what I want to <laughs> do. Um, having somebody that desires to to be in front of the camera and to, you know, it, and I say be in front of the camera, that's what I want to do. But if you have somebody that wants to engage the community through social media, through postings, through making videos, if it's artistic or if it's uh, news style or if it's um, whatever they want to do, they're graphic design professionals and they want to do more graphic design, as long as they're all in on it and they understand the role that they're sitting in, um, I think it can be really successful in a lot of different ways. Um, the thing I love seeing right now is I'm seeing other agencies and I can say this because I'm not um, on my page, but I feel like they're copying what we're doing. <laughs> and I think it's really cool to see that other agencies are now putting out body camera and they have yeah. a representative talking about what you're going to see in this video. Because um, when I got here, I didn't want to be that guy that um, you'll see in some bigger agencies. They have somebody, they'll have a podium, they have all their chief and command staff up there and the chief, the sheriff, or their their lieutenant will say, we're going to review this shooting footage today and I'm going to tell you what happened. And it's going to be a serious press conference. It's very monotone and they'll, you know, they have good information to put out. But in a way, it's like, well, that shouldn't be the only time that we're giving you this information, too. So there is a time and a space for that. And like I said, in a homicide video, I'm not cracking jokes. Mm -hmm. It's not the time to be silly or, or funny or add something at the very end of the video. But when I get to talk about other things or when I get to introduce you to a deputy or a unit that we're working with, um, you should let your personality come out a little bit. Yeah. I'm a video production guy and I'm a goofball at heart. Um, you're going to just a tip for everybody. When you watch our videos, you got to watch all the way in to the end credits because that's where I'm going to put little Easter eggs in there for <laughs> the goofy stuff that happened or a little cameo by somebody or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, one of the things that people ended up really liking, it was a complete accident. Uh, at the very end of the video, we um, have our logo come up on the screen. Mm -hmm. It used to be a star or sheriff badge that it would come across and go whoosh. And I was like, ah, I don't really like it. Let's do our patch because it's a little bit more iconic because everybody has a, sh a star for their badge mm -hmm. for sheriffs. Um, so we started using our patch, and I made it to where it kind of stomps on the screen, and I found a uh, – the, the, the sound, I think, was called stomp. So it kind of mm -hmm. comes up on the screen and it goes boom. Mm -hmm. and um we finished recording one of my sound bites and uh he's still rolling because you let it roll for a couple seconds after every shot and yep. i go Psh. <laughs> and uh from that my video production specialist said we got to use that mm -hmm. i said you can't use that i said i was imitating what the mountain does at the end of the video i was yeah. like he's like no i think it's great and uh he kept it 
Um, like I said, I don't have to get approval for everything, but I do have chiefs review my videos before I put them out. And they came in and they saw that and the room just broke out into laughter and they're like, that was great. You got to do that. And, um, that kind of, you know, again, that's part of my silly personality that I have, but that has stuck and people constantly are commenting, uh, you know, where was the punch? There's no punch at the end. Or when I say, Hey, good job. People post in the comments, a little fist emoji. (laughs) So. Uh, I, I think you should, again, the number one thing, they got to want to do it and you got to have fun. Yeah. Um, if I was just serious and monotone all the time and be like, Man, this is really hard. And you, like you said, we go out to scenes and deputies and officers might be laughing or firefighters and yep. doctors when they do a surgery, they got to be able to break the ice and yes. you know, get back to reality. It's like, I can't be sad all day. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't need to be that way in this profession either. Um, being a public information officer, you get the message out the best you can. Uh, there's a guy, I think, in Louisiana that has a really great following on social media. Bald guy like us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I just saw his video a second ago. Someone pulled over on the side of the road because they saw him standing there. And they're like, look who I found over here. And yeah. had a great interaction with that person. And those are the interactions. We have a lot of them every day. Yeah. And I hope that. I don't get to see a lot of people in this role because I'm in my office downtown, mm-hmm. but I hope that that kind of has carried over. Like people see me and they're like, that's that guy. Oh yeah. yeah. I like that guy. He's cool. And mm-hmm. I appreciate them. And I appreciate his department because I see all the great stuff that they're doing yeah. the way he's reporting it. I think to understanding the platform you're posting on, right? Like the, get doing that with the fist and then getting that engagement helps everything. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting more likes, more comments, people asking on other comments. That continues to pay forward, which the algorithms love. <laughs> and so you're going to indirectly be able to push other stuff even more by understanding that, which I think some departments struggle with. It's just, you know, let's get it out there. That's that. And people like it. But there's nothing to comment on. You've kind of laid it out. Leaving those little Easter eggs yeah. out there helps a lot. <laughs> um, something you talked about, it sounds like you have a lot of trust from the people you answer to. And that matters a lot in every line of work, but especially that line of work. And how did you get to that point? Because, you know, from being able to release body camera footage and not just when the public demands it, but proactively getting body camera footage out there, whether it be good, bad, and different, and being able to get your message out there. Sounds like you do have a chief review, but it's it's a pretty fluid process, it sounds like, at the pace where I've I've talked to other departments and, you know, they put something together first that has to be talked about then shot, then approved, and now you're the next day. And, of course, the news has already come out there and pillaged it and ran it. How did you get to that? And is, is it a testament to the organization, or what was that process like? Having the sheriff being your boss and then having him do, do 20 years in your role before he stepped into yeah. the sheriff's role was a huge a huge impact, which allowed me to do this. Um, I think at other agencies, you got to build that trust uh, because – it's kind of scary. It's actually very scary. We got body cameras in 2021. And so we didn't know what the formula was going to be. How do we decide when to release, what we release, how much do we release, who do we release, who can ask for it? Mm-hmm. You know, you have to public disclosure requests that anyone can go and request body camera from footage of an incident they were involved in, things like that. The media can request all sorts of stuff. But um, when they ask me, when do I say yes or when do I say, oh, no, you're not getting it? And um, I wanted to make sure that I knew what the rules were because I'm much better knowing where my boundaries are than I am if I have no idea what I'm swimming in. So if you asked me to open up an IRA account for you, I'd have no clue what to do. And I'd be like, well, how much of your money you want me to spend? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it would be a very scary process of getting that base knowledge. Um, I took the same a little one, two hour course with the public disclosure folks that are in charge of releasing those uh, the requests of body cameras so that I understood what those rules were and I could stay within those guidelines at the bare minimum. And uh, one of the questions I asked our civil attorney was I said, hey, so if the media asked me to release video, like, I mean, how do I decide to release that stuff? He said, well, you're a detective. You know what uh, what's going to ruin a case or stuff like that. He's like, but if it's not and you don't have any, there's no IA going on where you can't release information. He's like, then just give it to him. Yeah. And I was like, I was sitting there going, just give, oh, well, if I can give it to the media, why can't I use it? Mm-hmm. We should use it. In fact, let's do it. 
Um, so that was my first step. And then it was a challenge when it was really like, okay, we're going to do this. And the very first body camera footage that we ever released was a uh, school resource office, uh, deputy sent me a photo of a little dog that the fire department rescued from a burning trailer right next to one of our precincts. And, and then she sent me some other photos of her um, holding the dog and the firefighters holding the dog and the dog had a gas mask on his face. And I'm like, this is great. What else happened? She's like, well, the guy was trying to um, go back in the house to save the dog. You know, we, we told him he couldn't go back in and then the uh, fire department came and rescued the dog. And I'm like, cool. But I wanted to go watch the body camera footage. So I watched the footage and I saw what I thought was uh, more important than anything else that happened that day. It was the compassion that our deputy yeah. had at the scene. Um, I'm telling you right now, other people did not want this video released. They thought, you are just picking on that old man. You're using his emotions as a, a thing to try to get views. And I'm like, our deputy did a absolutely fantastic job. That's what I want to show. And yes, it's very heartfelt. No, the dog didn't die. It's fine. People might get emotional over it, but they probably should because this is what we see all the time. Yeah. The deputy saw the guy going toward the house. Um, there's fire everywhere inside the house. She's like, get away, get away, get away. She's walking up to the door. He's coming down the steps and a big explosion goes off. Well, not like a movie explosion, but fireball comes out the front door, actually burn the guy's head. And she gets to him and, and brings him to the front yard and says, no, no, stay here. He can't go. And he's like, but my dog's in there. And he's pleading to go get his dog. And he says, I don't care about me. I want, I want to, I got to go get my dog. And she says, but I care about you. And she's rubbing his back and patting him and trying to keep him calm yeah. and let him know it's going to be okay. And she's like, the fire department's right here. They're going to get your dog for you. Story ends, the dog saved, uh, gas mask, all that stuff. If I just posted photos of the dog with a gas mask, firefighters holding the dog, and this blurry photo of the deputy carrying the dog, um, it doesn't really tell the story. Right. But that 20 seconds of body camera, that emotion that was captured there, that no one ever gets to see on the day-to-day, -day, that's not a police call. That's a fire call. Yeah. She stepped in. She did the right thing. She helped this man. It was very powerful. Yeah, That was the first video I ever got to release. It did very well, and the Chiefs loved it. And at that point, I think I had a little bit more buy-in. Yeah. That, hey, this is, this is really good for us. Um, it's really good for our IA investigations because the IAs have gone way, way down because you can mm. disprove what people are seeing a lot quicker. But um, being able to share a message in my role this is not scripted. That body camera, they know that they have them, but they're acting the way they always would. They're not putting on a show. And that's what's really powerful about being able to use that camera um, to tell you what, what's really going on behind the scenes um, and just giving you a quick perspective of who we are as a department, who we are as individuals, as police officers, um, and, and kind of shows you a little bit more why we do what we do. Yeah. There'll probably be footage right now playing of Sheriff, now Sheriff Troyer, back in his day. He was a very unique PIO, um, very proactive on TV frequently, a lot more, especially back then, it seemed to be a very different type of business. So it makes sense, that you two having that relationship now and him coming from that position to being able to set you up for success too, to let your skills flourish, because he's somebody who understands the game very, very, very well. On a side note for yeah. the, the whole dog sort, the, I almost don't want to say this, but when the, the the funniest part of the whole thing, it's animal lovers, you can tell me if it's funny or not, but the old man was worried about the dog. There was three cats, I think, that died in that fire, and um, he wasn't going back in for the cats. So. <laughs> I, am, I am a dog lover all the way through. I don't have good relationships with cats either, so I'm like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. But. <laughs> it's interesting that you've been able to find a noticeable decline in IA, IA investigations just by disclosing. So in some ways, I would suspect then that you actually have loosened up some resources along the way or freed some resources up that would otherwise be in potential investigations. 
what are some, have you found any negatives to doing it this way that are worth the challenge, but have created challenges for you? Um, I think the only downside for me is that I'm extremely busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, if you notice my videos, I say the date and time and the Axon puts the date and time on the screen. So when you're watching one of the videos that we put out, take notice, I'm not posting a day of, uh, mm. there's very few times where I'll post body camera footage the same day something happens. And that's just cause there's a process to get it done and edited and filming me on camera, narrating the story. So I try to pick and choose the most relatable things, the things that are like really, really cool and awesome stuff. The things that people are going to want to see the deputy barking like a dog, <laughs> um, and getting a capture there. But, uh, if we have something that is a little bit more, um, urgent news to put out, like we catch a homicide suspect and maybe that was a pursuit. I'll just release that without my narration because, Hey, you guys want to see these guys getting into custody. Here it is right here. And more often than not, that's kind of driven by the news too. They requested, Hey, you guys caught this guy. Can we get that video? And I'm like, yeah, let me go over and do some edits and send it off. Cause I end up redacting all the stuff myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but Axon's program makes it pretty easy to do that, which is helpful too. Um, the, it was the question was the like hard things. Yeah. About any challenges way. you found, obviously they're still worth it, but what, what things did you, were you maybe not prepared for that would cause challenges along the way? Um, I say that, that, that time again is, is the one hard thing. Um, my goal when I first started was before I was releasing body cameras to put, cause I have a full-time videographer that works with me mm. trying to get out two videos a month was my, my minimum goal. I said, let's just see how this works. Cause we were doing more longer format stories of here's what our SWAT team does. Here's who our dive team is. And here's all the equipment they have. So, you know, you're doing a, a shoot on two training days and then you got to edit it. I've got to say my part, we're interviewing people that don't do media every day and, doing an hour for those interviews. So it was, uh, you know, two to three days to get one of those done where the, the quicker format videos I can finish in maybe three hours. Mm. Um, but I think one of the hardest things for me is figuring out, um, the content that I want to post every day. You got to pick and choose what's, what's going to go out, making sure that we're still giving out the, the most information that we can. Um, but also finishing the rest of my role, which is the media requests. I do all the bulletins for our department, making sure those get, get put out. It's really come down to this time crunch for me to make sure I can manage all of it. And then when you guys see me on TV, you see me on the one channel that you like to watch, but I might be doing stories for five or six channels or mm -hmm. when somebody decides to blow up Transformers on Christmas Eve, then I'm doing all of our local channels all of our radio stations and all the national channels as well. Um, and then I have to put my work on the back burner while I'm doing all this, uh, uh, you know, happening now news. Um, staying relevant is always going to be key for whoever's filling in the position. Um, I won't be in it forever. Um, but whoever does come in the position, I would give them the same advice. It's like, hey, you got to make this your thing. Don't do exactly what I did because that worked for me, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons I really like watching your TikToks and your Instagram videos <laughs> is like, you make it work the way that you need it to yeah. work for you. And you're not trying to copy somebody that you yes. saw on TikTok or somebody that's on the news. You give information that is helpful. That's a little bit more than what you get in the minute 30 on, on a TV channel. And that's just the way it is, but it's not over the top where I'm getting a 60 minutes episode and I don't have right. time for it, but I get a lot more information because you're reading the the warrant, you're reading the probable cause statement, or you're reading the articles that were released by the actual agencies. And then I get to do with that information what I want. Most people already make up their mind, but yeah. you know, you give a really good presentation that allows me to, to do what I need to do with the information. So uh, moving forward, I think staying relevant will be important for the next PIOs that yeah. come out in this field. Um, TikTok is one that I will I will not be venturing into. I'm not going to be doing dances. Yeah. I'm silly and goofy, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that anytime soon. Um, but you know, recruiting wise, has been really hard to get people to sign up for law enforcement, and it's really hard when you're competing with every other agency. So add that in there too, with all the other stuff. I'm trying to get recruitment out there as well. 
Um, I hope that the vid- the other videos that we're making, not specifically recruiting, but that those would get people excited about our department, seeing how we do what we do. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's not about likes and clicks and shares and yeah. follows, but it is at the same time. And so I want to make our department as relevant as we can be. Um, I think it would probably be easier if I just had like a Darren Moss <laughs> Instagram page and I yeah. could just share you what my day looks like, mm-hmm. but that's just going to add more to my plate. So sure. that's one of the difficult things I find is trying to break in with, I am a, I guess th- here, this is my, <laughs> now I remember what it is. Mm-hmm. My biggest challenge is I was a broadcast news major. So I'm supposed to be on the other side of the camera asking the hard questions, getting down to the nitty gritty. And then I step in this room and it's like, oh, you're actually a PR guy. Yeah. You are the one that makes sure the department looks good. So I want to balance that. Yeah. Um, and I don't balance that by lying or by hiding information. There's been several stories that are printed where I have to give a comment on something negative going on with our department, whether we're being sued, whether somebody's you know in trouble for something, or somebody got arrested or fired for something. Um, and I gotta, I'm not looking to spin everything. Yeah. You know, that's people think, well, you're a PR guy, you're just gonna always push that. Well, you guys, did something really, really bad, but here's the bright side of it. It's like, well, sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's just, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, coat it. This is what happened, and we're going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Um, and I think by doing all these stories and people getting comfortable with seeing me and, and hearing our reporting, when we do have to talk about the tough stuff, that that is going to be received well. Because the last thing I want to do is, is end up being like uh, – can't remember the name of the show, but Jim Carrey, he gets promoted to some guy that has to go on MSNBC right yeah. before the, the company shuts down, and he's the fall guy. Yeah, I don't ever want to be caught with my pants down on camera and be like, <laughs> what did we do? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Um, well, everything's okay, people. You know? Yeah. There's there's really no place for that in what we're doing. Um, I got to get you the information. Got to get you accurate information. If I can't talk about something, I can't. Right. You won't hear it from me. I'm not going to talk about an internal investigation. I'm not going to talk about the details of our homicide investigation before we're ready to release it. Um, And I hope that people can appreciate that. Um, So I'm always looking to make sure that um, I'm balancing that PR aspect with the, you know, we're not, I'm not just pushing rainbows and butterflies here. So I'm always going to tell you the the truth about what's going on. And and one of the things that's hard for some other agencies is crime stats and crime is going up. Yeah. And some people want to, city managers or cities might tell the department that they have to report it in a positive way because we don't want our city to seem unsafe. And I don't think that's fair to the public. And thankfully the sheriff will never ask me to do that. So I don't have to. And, and we never will. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, creative process and so, or, you know, personalizing it. And this is a very creative process and, it can be hard, I think, sometimes for certain types of organizations, law enforcement, one very rigid type of work to understand that creative process can't be forced. You got to do it the way it works for you. In, inherently, you will then do it better because you're going to respond better. Your energy is going to be better. And to your point, if another department wants to go this path, take it as a, as a, as a guide, not a manual. Yeah, and let that person who comes in make it their own because it, it will make it more relatable to the public if they can be themselves within the guidelines that make it responsible, <laughs> but make it work. You know, I'm, I'm a middle aged guy. I do TikTok. I can't. I can. I can probably get more views trying other stuff. I'm who I am. It works, and and I can go to bed at night knowing that I did the best that I could. Does that mean that I got the most views? Maybe not, but. It works. And so finding that for every single person is it's got to be you is this is you coming out there and you're going on camera and you're putting your personality out there. It's got to be in a way that works for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the agencies that I, you know, I follow all the local agencies around us and um, I will see people do stuff totally different ways. The fire departments are always fun because, um, yeah. you know, they're just at the station all day because they're not doing anything. Yeah. So, so. I've been told. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But having their social media person that is, um, they have a lot of time to stage photos or do um, goofy things for like this event of the day and stuff. And it's like, well, I'm downtown and all my guys are spread out in the other 
couple of miles that we've got to yeah. patrol, so I can't always get around them. But um, yeah, it's just, there's some really creative people that are doing lots of good stuff. And State Patrol, Washington State Patrol, they have nine uh, or seven PIOs, and each one of them has two backups, and then they have a supervisor that yeah. works in Olympia. And what I love about their department's social media outreach is they can pull from any one of those people. And what I really like, they also have a bunch of recruiters. They're all different. Mm. All of them do it in a different way. Some of them like to be on camera. Other PIOs are like, don't you ever put me on camera. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's that's like in a perfect world, I, I want each agency to be able to go out and express what their department is doing give accurate and important information to their to the public but do it in a way that, that works for you guys because this trooper is doing it this way this deputy does it this way and this officer or this firefighter does it a different way and the most important thing we're all in public safety we want to make sure we're informing our community what's going on and if if this is the way that works for you and your community is responsive to it then that's great right what's next for you um, you know, I, it's a, it's an appointed position. So I'm at the sheriff's will. If he says, Darren, you're doing terrible. I'm gone. Um, for me, I still want to, I still want to do really good in this role. Um, I may, I may be looking for other roles because one of the things we do, we do a ride along show where my cameraman rides passenger with a deputy and I go with them to kind of provide extra security for my cameraman and I'm a backup deputy just in case because I would hate for them to be out on a call. I'm not there and something really yeah. bad happens. and They don't have any backup. Yeah. Um, but when I go out on those calls, you, you miss it. You really miss being on the road. So um, I absolutely love being the PIO, but I could take another role if it came available. Um, but we'll see. I'm not I'm not going to rush anything. We'll see what happens. But uh, I do miss miss it sometimes but i could be here for another 10 or 15 years as long as the next sheriff wants me around <laughs> yeah what was the call that that call you had that you still remember today that solidified you were in the right right job in law enforcement for me um you know a lot of people have these maybe have a heroic story of something crazy that happened and, and they remember that um i think the first time I kind of knew I was in the right spot was I would go brand new. I was 21 years old, starting out in San Diego in a big city. And I just gotten married. And so I'd been married in the Academy. I think it was only like four or five months before I went to patrol and I'm going to a DV call and they're asking me for marriage advice. And I was 21 years old and I'm like, Hey man, you know, just got to, do whatever, you know, listen to each other and stuff, you know, don't get, don't, whatever advice I gave, I can't remember. And they would say, man, you sound like, you know what you're doing. Like, how old are you? You look really young. And I was like, oh, I'm 30. <laughs> <laughs> For my entire career in my 20s, I told everybody I was 30 because I just, I looked too young yeah. and people wouldn't listen to you if you were too young. And so I have always thought that was fun to be able to give that advice to people and then they were really receptive to it and I had to just make sure they didn't like discredit me because of my age. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I start with that part of it. The thing that really got to me one day I went to a domestic violence call and I believe the, the, the male half had already left. He was a suspect in the whole thing. And I was talking to the victim and telling her, you know, you've got options. Uh, I'm going to give you some resources. You know, we all have these pamphlets that we're mandated to give out, but they do have phone numbers and, and shelter information and things like that for these people that are going through a tough time. And I remember I was just talking to her and I was, you know, I'm like, man, this, I listened to what she said and it sounded really tough. People don't realize like, Oh, you should just leave them. It's not, it's not always that simple. And when I was talking to her, I could feel the heartbreak that she was feeling. And she started tearing up. And I started tearing up. And I didn't, there was nothing that I accomplished. I took a report and I, I gave her some resources. But I just listened to her and I was feeling empathy for what was going on. And she said, thank you for, for helping me today. 
And so forever, that's going to feel better than I caught that guy and I put the handcuffs on. You know, that feels great. And that's when you're pumping your fist and you got that adrenaline going. Those are awesome moments. But those one-on-one moments, we take, you know, 10, 12, 15 reports in a day sometimes. Some of them are really small. Some of them are bigger. But um, having that effect on a person and knowing that you're doing whatever you can to help them and them um, them feeling that thankfulness, like, yeah. I don't need that. But that moment there, I'd been to a bunch of DVs in my first year, and this one stuck out more than any other one I went to because she really, you know, it just hit me that she appreciated what I was doing. And I honestly couldn't do anything else for her that day. Like, I'm not going to find this guy. He's gone. I got to go to another DV call right after this one. Yeah. I really didn't provide a whole lot. But her reception to me being there, being somebody that she could talk to, it was like, this is, this feels right. This feels really good. Yeah. I want to keep doing this for people. Is there anything you wish we talked about today that I'd asked? Um, I think we talked. Like I talk a lot. <laughs> you kind of just let me go, and I'm like, I don't even think we're on topic anymore. That's what we do here. I like to let everybody. Every that's it. That's it. What I like about doing this, different than the news stuff, is we try and fit it really tight. Here we can just let it go. So and see where see where the conversation goes. Thank you for driving all the way out here. Thank you for being so open. Hopefully, some other departments are watching, getting some ideas, and and. Might may even reach out to you to get some advice, but thank you for yeah. what you do in yeah, the service you. community. And I would tell anybody, um, you're watching this on your phone or at home, uh, reach out to me. I answer a lot of the questions on Instagram, specifically not Facebook. I'm not a Facebook guy, <laughs> but you can reach reach me personally on the on the Instagram account um, if you have questions about our department. We're really receptive. We answer um, your comments. We answer your questions in our messages. Um, the sheriff's department is a really, really great place to work for. We're always hiring. Um, but, um, anybody that's considering law enforcement, you know, they would hate for me to say this, but I really, wherever you are, if you can do it in your local community and you want to help out and you want to be a police officer, go for it because there's a lot of great things that you'll get to do that you never, ever thought you'd, that you would get to do or that you'd be able to accomplish, um, I've seen lots of videos and stuff where deputies do amazing things and it's stuff that they're, they're normal everyday people, but yeah. they take extraordinary risk and measures to make sure that everyone else in their neighborhood is safe. And I think that's really commendable, which is the reason why I do this. Are you guys ever going to go back on cops again? Somebody asked us that. I, uh, they wrote a comment on cops saying they had new episodes coming out yeah. and, uh, I said, Sheriff's Department, are you guys going to be there? And I said, I'd love to, but uh, we didn't get an invite. And cops responded and said, hey, we'll be reaching out soon. Yeah. So maybe one day. <laughs> Those episodes get played a lot. Those were iconic episodes a lot that were down there. So it goes back a ways. And, and you guys had another run at it not that long ago, too, now that I think about it. There yeah, I think some it was 2018, because yeah. I believe I was a supervisor then. We had a couple episodes there on cops. So yeah. our guys really love it. Um Cops is a is a very fun show, but I would tell you guys yeah. <laughs> watch our ride along episodes that we have yeah. on YouTube or our Instagram or Facebook. It's kind of the same format where you have somebody riding with a police officer and they're they're going call to call. But what what you may not realize, or maybe you do, there's three segments on cops and they're different agencies most mm-hmm. time, or sometimes it's all one agency, but it might be a different day. They ride with a deputy for two weeks. And then they're going to put one or two episodes out for mm-hmm. that entire two weeks. And they might pick the best calls or, well, these are the only calls we can get people to, to <laughs> sign off on. Uh, when we do our ride-alongs, you're seeing a full or partial shift for that day. So you get a better look at what it's actually like to do the job mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, I thought you guys just shot at people and drove fast yeah. all day. And it's like, no, he had to go take this report. Then we had to go look for the suspicious person. Then we had to do this DV call. Then we did have something crazy going on, and then at the end of the night, he's just writing his report. So some of them are really high speed. Some of them are, for me, very slow and boring. But at the same time, that deputy tells you everything he's doing and tells you what he's thinking, and you get a better inside look at what what we do day to day. Some of those old episodes look like you guys were wild from log in to log out front (laughs) to back. So, Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out here. Uh, Thank you. All right.